This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. Straight ahead on the program, the holidays are over. So how did the nation's retailers fare? I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. We're asking if political and business leaders can rebuild trust at this year's World Economic Forum in Davos. I'm Brian Curtis in Hong Kong. With Taiwan election results looming, we look at Taiwan Semiconductor at a delicate time in the chip industry. I'm Kaylee Lyons in Washington, where we're looking ahead to the Iowa caucuses. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the business news you need to wrap up your week. Available on Apple, Spotify, the Bloomberg Business app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby. We begin today's program with a look at the strength of the U.S. consumer through the lens of the holiday and fourth quarter retail sales. And we take a peek at the year ahead. We're joined today by Poonam Goyle, Senior Retail Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, and Molly Smith, Bloomberg News Economy Editor. Thank you both for being here. Poonam, it's still a little early, but what we've heard so far about retail sales and and December's numbers, we know the National Retail Federation says sales last month up 3%, 5% for all of last year. MasterCard spending pulse, an increase of 3.1, not spectacular, but would you say pretty solid? Yeah, I'd say, you know, the holiday season rang in pretty solid results. In fact, um, a number that you didn't cite was the Adobe number, where they came out with also a slight increase, which suggests that online sales also did well. So we think holiday overall did do well. And a large part of that was the strength that we saw in November versus December. So it was a great start to holiday. It ended okay and led the season to be higher than what most had expected. And Molly, I'm going to ask you about what that means for the consumer. We have a a very strong labor market, right? Unemployment holding steady, just 3.7% last month, what appears to be a soft landing. What does it look like? I think it's uh, it's maybe a little bit more... uh complicated than that that uh the the jobs report yeah on the surface that we got for the month of December looks great from the headline number in terms of the payrolls the unemployment figure that you cited wage growth but there are a few other things under the surface like duration of unemployment growing longer and a few other caveats that made this maybe just not as strong as you might expect and is kind of contributing then to what we're expecting to be a slowdown in consumer spending this year. I know we've been calling for that for a while. There have been people who would have expected us to have a recession already, like you said, look like that's probably not going to happen. But there has just been this really outsized strength in consumer spending, given all of these other this other macro backdrop that you would have expected consumer spending to taper off by now. And I think the cumulative effect of the inflation that we've had for the last year and a half, plus now higher borrowing costs and how much longer they're going to stay this elevated level is probably going to lead to consumer spending tapering off in this year. And you talked about the higher borrowing costs for consumer spending. We're still spending, but it looks like we're charging more, more than ever before. There is, yeah, definitely has been a pickup in credit card balances. I think important, though, to keep that in the context of um, deposits, and those are still pretty high. So when you look at uh, card balances to deposits, it's not as startling of a rise as if you were to just look at card balances in an absolute dollar amount. So I think that's important to remember. And when we talk about the consumer, obviously, like that's you know, millions and millions of people. There's obviously a lot of different income brackets within that, a lot of different spending propensities. So important to keep in mind that this isn't really a broad, you know, decline in spending power. Uh, It's really more affecting consumers at the lower end the most, as you would expect. And higher end, uh, you know, higher income earners are still really propping up a lot of the aggregate numbers. Poonam, let's turn to you. Let's talk about some of the retailers that really did benefit, no matter who the shoppers are, high end, low end. We heard from Abercrombie & Fitch, Lululemon, American Eagle, all reporting strong sales and strong outlooks. Who else have you heard from? Well, those are the few that we've heard from, and we'll hear from more as they report earnings. But we did see um, strength in the Amazon numbers based on our own channel checks and what we're hearing. So we do think that's another retailer or web giant that will continue to take share 
not just for the holiday, but even as we move into 2024, as spending just shifts more online, broadly speaking. The one interesting thing that I will call out, and just to piggyback on Molly's comments on the credit card, you know, part of the reason that we saw such strength in 2024 was the rise of BNPL, which is buy now, pay later. And in fact, from data that we're seeing in 4Q, BNPL spending online was up 14% year over year. And that's based on Adobe's estimates. So as consumers leverage this new payment option and really use that to stretch their wallets, we'll probably continue to see more of that heading into 2024 too. And you talked about uh, more use by the lower end consumer. Let's talk about the lower end consumer and where we see some of the the big giants like Walmart, Target, uh, Kohl's, another big discounter. What did you see this past season and what do you see ahead, Poonam, for those big retailers? Yes, I think the big retailers, you know, it's a double edged sword for them because they are getting um, spend from people that are trading down or people that want to stretch their dollars further. They're seeing that um, spend come through. But then at the same time, they're also grappling with just uh, consumers that don't have enough to spend and also deflation. Right. We saw deflation kick in, at least in a lot of the consumables later in the year. So because of that, you're seeing some pressure on their top line, which we think could continue into 2024, especially early 2024. Now, you wrote a piece, I think it came out just last week, about the challenges in retail, specific to the retail calendar. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, regardless of where consumer spending shapes out to be this year, we're entering the year with fewer shopping days between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and that's five fewer shopping days. So that means that consumers are going to have to consolidate their purchases in a shorter window, and there's fewer days for retailers to try to sell them more. That's a negative. The other negative is coming up shortly, which is Easter. Easter this year falls on March 31st versus later in April in years past. So that means temperatures will be cooler, It means that um, consumers may be spending a little less. Historically, when Easter has come earlier, it has impacted sales of food and clothing, and that could occur again this year. Molly, where do you see the the calendar falling in for consumer spending? I just always have to, like, smile a little because, you know, we always say, like, the weather one way or the other seems to play a role in this. You know, it was, like, too cold. People didn't shop. It was too warm. People wanted to play outside and didn't shop. So there's always some kind of factor and, you know, who who the heck knows? So it'll it'll play out um, in due time. That's certainly more Poonam's specialty than mine to forecast how the weather will factor into spending patterns. But, you know, she raised an interesting point, though, about how retailers have been seeing deflation for a few months. And that was something that when we just got the Consumer Price Index report last week, that was for the month of December, really important moment here where the goods sector, you know, this is where all of like the the purchases of stuff like cars, furniture, clothing, things of that nature, that sector has been showing price declines, had been showing price declines, sorry, for six months. And that unexpectedly stopped in December. That was a, that's a really key potential turning point because this has been in the broader context of where is inflation going? The goods sector has been driving so much of the disinflation that we've been seeing in recent months. And now it's kind of raising some questions. Is that running out of steam? How much more can the supply side continue to help? Uh, So that's going to be a really key question going forward for retailers and for the economy. Uh, Unless you're selling houses, of course. Yeah, still pretty. (laughs) car insurance. Yeah, still. uh, Both of those also still pretty expensive. Um, So also have not really turned out to be the bigger disinflation story that you would have hoped to see in rents so far. Those are still pretty expensive. Now, Molly, one more thing I want to ask you and and Poonam. It looks, excuse me, it looks like we're not going to see an interest rate cut anytime soon. Maybe, maybe according to the Fed back half of the year. And, And that'll certainly impact borrowing costs. How do you think that will help consumers? Well, I think right now, you know, the bets are still kind of coalescing around the earliest uh, being for a March reduction, which um, Fed officials have pushed back on that pretty strongly. Uh, But I mean, it's it's still really tough to tell when that is going to come. Um, I mean, I don't think the uh, you know, the reports that we were just talking about, the CPI that we just got or retail sales coming up, those aren't going to really 
you know, move the needle in terms of uh, where that's where that when that cut's going to happen. But for um, I mean, consumers can definitely count on borrowing costs coming down this year. I, it's more a question just of when rather than if. And Poonam, final thoughts? Yeah, and I'd say if those borrowing costs do come down, which they are likely to, that is on the on on the note, like it would be positive for consumer spending, right? Just just the idea of borrowing costs coming down and the rates coming down would be positive to consumer spending this year. Oh, that's great. Well, our thanks to Poonam Goyle. She's senior retail analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence and Molly Smith, Bloomberg News economy editor. Coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, it's that time of year for the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Who's going and what's on the agenda? I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, the Iowa caucuses begin jump-starting the Republican presidential nominating race. But first, the Globe's political, corporate, and cultural elite gathering in a tiny alpine village in Switzerland for the World Economic Forum. For a look at what to expect, we turn to Stephen Carroll in London. Tom, it's the annual pilgrimage to Davos for the event that's over the years been dubbed everything from globalist Glastonbury to speed dating for CEOs. This year's World Economic Forum will be attended by more than 2,700 political and business leaders, including the Chinese Premier Li Chung, Francis Emmanuel Macron, the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and the Israeli President Isaac Herzog. There's plenty to discuss on the geopolitical front, but also the hundreds of CEOs attending will be talking about economic issues as well as new technologies and climate climate change. We'll have full coverage across Bloomberg Radio and television throughout the event. Our editor-at-large, Francine Lacour, will be there speaking to some of the big names, and she's with me now. Uh, Fran, this is, of course, in theory, an economic event, but are economic issues this year in Davos being overshadowed by things like the wars in the Middle East and in Ukraine? A hundred percent. I think there are mainly three themes, and I know it's always... I mean, the themes that the World Economic Forum pick are always, um, I guess, the, the you know, yeah, a lot rebuilding of people trust do, this year. <laughs> do yeah. make jokes about it because uh, some of the predictions don't end up actually being the right ones. But rebuilding trust, I think they're probably focusing on three things. It is monetary. So it, it's what's happening with interest rates. Do we have a big pivot from central banks? What does does to inflation? And therefore, does that help and support governments and companies? Remember, 2023 was meant to be the washout year. We started the year by saying companies will go back us, countries will get into very, very large debt situations, and it hasn't really played out yet. The second thing the World Economic Forum participants, I think, will really focus on is AI, and we're expecting a number of papers from the World Economic Forum to trying to figure out exactly how you protect yourself for disinformation, for fake news, especially in an election year. Now, I'm not only talking about the U.S., we have the European Parliament, we have, I think, over 50% of world Mm -hmm. GDP going to the polls, so a lot of the folks will be on that. And then third one, 100%, will be geopolitics. So we have two active wars, uh, Ukraine, the one between Israel and Hamas, and there's, you know, concerns that, of course, the Middle East tensions spill over. Um, so I think a lot of the sessions and the conversations will be around that and, and what it means for the world economy. Now, every year the World Economic Forum publishes its Global Risks report. Top of the list, you mentioned there, misinformation and disinformation this year. You've been speaking to the Forum's Managing Director, Sadia Zahidi, about this. Let's take a listen. In the two-year time frame, um, mis- and disinformation, number one risk. So we put together the views of 1,500 experts, and that's what they're most wor- worried about, very closely followed by extreme weather, societal polarization, inflation. These are some of the topics that are top of mind. But 10 years out, four top risks all about the environment, including, for the first time, um, crossing tipping points for the Earth's systems. That's something that is top of mind, and I think the predictions that that could happen in 10 years and how severe that could be, deeply concerning. Uh, Disinformation, fake news is extremely worrying in an election year. We Mm. have a a large percentage of world GDP actually going to the polls this year. How worried are you about the US election? I mean, depending on how you count it, major economies with large populations, India, the US, um, are going into these elections. And what we found is that 
at each country level, in addition to the global risk around mis- and disinformation, it's usually ranked very high among the top five risks around the world, as is concerns about an economic downturn. So what we're thinking is when these two things come together, the economic hardship being faced by many people and the rise of synthetic content combined with going into an election year where people get to make decisions about who's going to be leading them, that together can be a very potent mix. And in particular, if some of those views start spilling over into very different perceptions of reality when it comes to health, when it comes to what people are thinking about education, what people think about specific people, who then becomes the owner of the truth. Yeah, and again, it, do you have a breakdown of actually this misinformation? Is it state actors? I know Russia has been involved in the past in U.S. elections. So we're seeing a concern that this could be become much more pervasive. To some extent, it's almost easier to track some of that state-sponsored disinformation and misinformation. But now, at some point, that starts spilling over, and it becomes very difficult to track, especially without tracking systems, watermarking systems, and especially without the public being well-educated about the risks of synthetic content, and especially when that is fake news. Does that have a clear impact on the economy, as I guess chief executives don't want to spend because they don't know what pans out in the next 12 months? So there's a lot of economic uncertainty. Um, we're seeing uh, a risk of the lack of economic opportunity. We're seeing inflation in the top 10. Yeah. We're seeing a lot of concerns around what exactly happens. And that's because of two different um, situations. One is, of course, there continues to be uncertainty as to what the policy outlook will yeah. be. Yes, we are starting to tend towards a softer landing. But at the same time, I think there are new pressures coming in, supply side pressures that are coming in. There's geopolitical risks um, out there and that may change what happens over the course of the coming year and then there's a longer term economic risk and that has a lot more to do with the divergence between developed and developing economies and that also has a lot to do with the divergence between um, high income people and low income people across all countries. That is the World Economic Forum's Sadia Zahidi Managing Director there speaking to Francine Lacroix. Francine's still with us. Fran you mentioned there the fact that it's a big election year globally with all of those different elections happening. Does that make the conversations in Davos different if some of those world leaders who are going to be attending are also going to be facing the electorate? I think so. I think if you look at the world economy and what we've been speaking with a number of participants in the markets is that actually in an election year, probably the incumbent will spend a lot more. So if you look at the economy, it's probably going to be more resilient this year had we not had elections because no one wants to go into an election with a weak economy. Now, I know it's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but it's probably something that gives us um, a a little bit of support for the outlook for a, a lot of these countries. Longer term, it's a really question mark about what happens. So some of the policies in place, it can be here in the UK. It could, of course, be the US, which changes everything in our relationship with China, climate change, some of the support um, that that a potential, for example, President Trump would give to companies. But if you also listen to what Sadia was saying about the top 10 risks, and I don't think we should underestimate this, Stephen, is that if you look at the two-year horizon, so people that they surveyed worry about misinformation, extreme weather events, social polarization, cybersecurity, 10 years, it's critical changes to Earth systems, biodiversity, extreme Mm. weather. But if you worry about what's happening in the next two years, and if you have bigger concerns that are different 10 years, then you don't address the longer term concerns. So there's also a real worry of everyone splitting and not really getting anything done to to managing the longer term risks. Yeah, and it's part of the the sort of dilemma that faces Davos every year is that often there are big long term issues that need to be talked about, but everyone's much more focused on what's happening in the coming months or the coming weeks as well. Much is made every year of the politicians who do and don't go to the World Economic Forum. Here in the UK, we had the opposition Labour leader Keir Starmer being criticised for attending last year. Is it a bad look in a year where we're talking about rebuilding trust if you go to Davos or if you don't go? I think it depends. I think it depends on cultural sensitivities of the country. I think if you're an emerging economy, uh, showing up in Davos and getting deals done on trade is a good thing. Mm. If you're Rishi Sunak and you're married to a billionaire, it's probably not a good look, which is why he stayed away last year. He's not expected to show up this year as well. If you're, you know, Mr. Zelensky, president of Ukraine, then it probably would be a good look, whether it's by a video or in person to show up to, to make sure that people don't forget Ukraine. So I think it's it's very personal. And whether you show up or not 
really gives you a glimpse, actually, of what your country is facing or your company is facing. OK, I'm looking forward to hearing the answers to those questions as well. Our editor-at-large, Francine Lacqua, full coverage from the World Economic Forum in Davos throughout the week here, a call across Bloomberg Radio, Television and, of course, online on the terminal as well. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. You can catch us every weekday morning here for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London and 1am on Wall Street. Tom. Thank you, Stephen. And coming up here on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we take a look at the geopolitical machinations surrounding the business of computer chip manufacturing. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. The incredibly complex, high-stakes business of making semiconductors has always been a battle of corporate giants. Now, it's also a race among governments, especially between China, the U.S., and Taiwan. With the Taiwan election now underway, an event closely watched by China, we take a look at the chip industry and how the geopolitics play out. Tom, we'll know the full results of the Taiwan election shortly. In the meantime, we thought it was a good time to take a look at the business climate on the island, especially through the prism of TSMC. Taiwan Semi is arguably one of the most important companies in the world and sits at the nexus of the relationship among the U.S., China, and Taiwan. Joining us now to look at TSMC and possibly the up-and-coming challenge from Huawei Technologies is Bloomberg's Vlad Savoff, tech editor here in Hong Kong. So Vlad, recently we learned that Huawei Technologies' latest laptop was running on a chip made by TSMC. This was a five nanometer chip and it was actually made by TSMC instead of Huawei. And that seemed to head off some of the talk about a Chinese technological breakthrough. How much did that revelation sort of mean in lowering the temperature in the relationship between US and China on chips? Well, a good way to think about it is if it wasn't the case, if it was Huawei actually making 5 nanometer chips, this would be the story we're all talking about for the entire January. Um, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan would have dropped everything else. Um, (laughs) He's got a very busy agenda, but he would have dropped everything else because this would have been a breakthrough that would have been entirely unforeseen. When you think about the sanctions that the U.S. has imposed on Chinese chip makers, This was what they were trying to prevent. So you can say they've been effective, but the reason we're talking about this in the first place is because of Huawei's 7 nanometer, a generation behind breakthrough uh, that happened uh, in August last year. That was also unforeseen and unexpected. Um, It's worth bearing in mind, again, that this chip that Huawei would have stockpiled from TSMC way back in 2020 is still one or two generations ahead of what Huawei is capable of doing, where China and manufacturers like, such as SMIC, which is Huawei's uh, domestic partner, are positioned at the moment. So what we can really say is that Huawei is certainly trying. Um, there are a number of voices, including NVIDIA, one of um, TSMC's biggest uh, customers, that say that Huawei and a whole bunch of uh, China mainland startups are going to be legitimate competitors, but we haven't seen the evidence. This would have been it. It didn't happen. Let me ask a question that may sound political, but it's not really. Uh, The sanctions that are in place by the U.S., is this slowing down the development by SMIC and by Huawei and others? Or in a sense, is it actually speeding it up? Because now in China, domestically, they know they need this. Well, absolutely it's political, but I keep saying every tech story nowadays is a political story. Every political story has a tech angle, so of course it is. Um, I think the answer is yes to both aspects of your question. It has categorically slowed down Chinese domestic chip making. Um, you have these key uh, machines which are bus sized and they cost hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars each, um, made by ASML in the Netherlands. Because of U.S. and Dutch relations, ASML doesn't ship those uh, super advanced machines into China. They are the effectively the gateway to getting to five nanometers and beyond. TSMC has a bunch of them. It spent tens of billions of dollars acquiring them. They can't get into China. Without them, China has to invent effectively alternative methods to get to those super advanced um, manufacturing techniques. Now, that being said, again, to the latter aspect of your question, because... China, Beijing, its government sees no breakthrough, no no path to coming to terms and acquiring those machines. 
in straightforward fashion, it is pouring money, resources, like I say, all these startups are effectively state-backed startups to, again, invent its way out of its uh, issue um, or maybe come up with more inventive ways of acquiring the machines. Can these companies in China catch up or will they always be one or two generations behind? Well, if you ask the U.S., um, they want them a couple of generations behind. That's effectively their entire agenda. They don't want to shut down Chinese tech manufacturing altogether. Um, they have repeatedly said that it's tailored sanctions that they have to prevent China's military from acquiring advanced tech. So if it's two, three generations behind, they're comfortable with that. Will they make – I mean, effectively, the answer to your question is, will China make a breakthrough that nobody is expecting? Mm. We saw some of that again last year from Huawei. Will they repeat the feat? It's um, open to a measure of guesswork, I suppose. In recent days, TSMC uh, gave us uh, its fourth quarter revenue. Some of these numbers were pretty decent. They did uh, beat estimates of a decline. Uh, but there's obviously a little bit of a slow path ahead. What they said was that demand from AI players offset the slower smartphone and laptop chip sales. Where are we now in terms of full recovery by the chip makers, including TSMC? Well, one of the things that we did over the course of the year on the terminal is we tracked Taiwanese suppliers to Apple, um, surely the most important tech company in the world. Um, and every month it was red figures. It's TSMC, Foxconn, etc. It was always down on the prior year's results. So just having a quarter that was flat, that was the same as the prior year, is heading in the right direction. Uh, TSMC executives, including CEO C.C. Wei, have said that they expect a rebound in 2024. Uh, Canalyst, one of the market research companies, they said that in the final quarter of the year, uh, the PC market and laptop market were up just by a couple of percentage points, like 3% altogether. But again, comparing that to uh, double-digit declines over the previous uh, several months, that's a big upside. So all of it seems to point toward uh, an improvement in consumer demand. Uh, inventory gluts that used to exist at the start of the year have gone away, so things are looking up. You referred earlier to the Huawei Mate 60 Pro and the fact that it had a 7 nanometer processor in it. Uh, what sort of progress is SMIC making in selling that outside of China? Well, I think uh, whatever SMIC is able to make in terms of manufacturing that particular chip it's probably all going to Huawei. When we talk to analysts looking at Huawei's prospects, it has already taken market share back from Apple and the iPhone in mainland China. Uh, one of the topics that might actually intensify in importance over the course of this year is the iPhone's fate in China, which has been increasingly down. Um, it was bad to begin with, it was underwhelming, and then it got worse. So Huawei is reclaiming that market share, but when we talk to analysts, they say that its limitation, if anything, on shipments is the amount of chips and devices that it can produce. So when we look at uh, the diminishing sales of Apple, who's gaining the lion's share of that in China? Right. As I say, it is Huawei. Huawei is number one. But then you have Honor, which is a company that uh, spun out of Huawei in 2020. It's an independent company. It's pursuing an IPO probably in the next year or so. That's what the company has said. Uh, Xiaomi has done a really good job over the past few months. The companies Vivo and Oppo, who used to be number one, two, three, every, every quarter they would shift places, they're the ones who are actually struggling. Um, the answer really is... Uh, that the Chinese smartphone manufacturing ecosystem is kind of shifting positions. Uh, Xiaomi and Huawei, I would say, are in the strongest position at the moment. And even worth mentioning, Samsung, which has had a tiny share of the Chinese market for a long time, is making efforts, making inroads as well. Vlad, outside of China, you mentioned Samsung. What are the prospects for its latest phone? Well... It's promising us the first AI phone, which is a promise that we've heard actually for years at this point. Um, the whole idea of branding your phone as an AI device is going to be the theme of 2024 across every smartphone manufacturer. And I'm looking forward to seeing Samsung, which is generally a serious company, try to justify that label. We can also look forward to Google, um, the designer and provider of the Android 
software and ecosystem to do more on this front, I expect. Uh, Google has always been a leader in AI. Uh, one of the things that came out of the CES trade show just recently is that Google and Samsung announced that they are collaborating on their quick sharing function, which is effectively the equivalent to Apple's AirDrop. All right, Vlad, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Vlad Savoff, tech editor here in Hong Kong. I'm Brian Curtis, along with Doug Krisner. You can catch us every weekday here for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, beginning at 7 a.m. in Hong Kong and 6 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Brian. Coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, a look ahead to the Iowa caucuses. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. The official start to the 2024 GOP presidential nominating process, the Iowa caucuses, begins on Monday. With just a handful of candidates on the ballot, one of them, former president and clear frontrunner Donald Trump, what can we expect to see? For more, let's head to our Bloomberg 99.1 newsroom in Washington and Bloomberg Sound On co-host Joe Matthew and Kaylee Lines. Yeah, Tom, we spoke with Kyle Kondik of Sabato's Crystal Ball at the University of Virginia and started by asking him, if we know Trump's probably going to win in Iowa anyway, what kind of margin matters? So the, the Trump campaign has noted accurately that, that of, of all the you know, contested you know, non-incumbent Republican Iowa caucuses over history, the biggest margin of victory is, uh, is 12 points. And so they're sort of setting the bar like, hey, we win by more than 12 points. That's good. I personally don't, you know, if they win by like 13 or 14, I don't think that that's some sort of impressive performance given what the polls are showing now, which is more like he's up by like 30 points. You know, what is the difference between a good performance and a bad one? I don't know. Maybe that's like 40 percent or something like that, um, which actually, you know, given the polls, he's consistently been over 50, 40 percent would seem maybe not that great. Um, so there is, you know, there are maybe there's maybe a higher bar for Trump to impress in Iowa. But if he matches the polls, he will have done that. I also think it's probably fair to treat Trump differently than you would in a, a normal non-incumbent race because he is sort of like a quasi-incumbent, given that he's the you know he, he's aiming for a third straight um, Republican presidential nomination and has already served the term as uh, president before. So I don't know where I'd put the number necessarily, but um, you know just just matching or slightly exceeding that historical you know 12-point margin that that probably is not good enough to be impressive. And in fact, I think it would probably be disappointing if it's close to that number, again, given what the polls say. Well, of course, everyone's banking on a surprise in New Hampshire because it's New Hampshire. Of course, it's not a surprise if you're expecting it. Uh, but after Chris Christie dropped out of the race, Kyle, I wonder your thoughts on the impact it could have on Nikki Haley. We've seen polls that show Donald Trump and Haley within single digits. This would make up the difference there. But we also heard from Christie himself, Hot Mike, she's not up for this. She's going to get smoked. Which Christie's right? Um, look, I I would not be surprised by Haley winning in New Hampshire. Um, I think she frankly needs to win New Hampshire to really um, to, to really justify staying in the contest. Frankly, um, you know, her home state of South Carolina votes like a month after New Hampshire, and so you kind of enter like a little bit of a dead period. There's um, there are contests in Nevada in early February, but um, there's a caucus that's actually awarding the delegates that Donald Trump's probably going to win easily. And then there's like a beauty contest primary that Haley's competing and she's not competing for the delegates, which she'll probably win comfortably. I don't know what you really do with that. So after New Hampshire, the focus will really go, go to South Carolina. But again, I, Haley, the coalition Haley is building is kind of kind of centered on more moderate voters. You know, a lot of independents can cross over and vote in the New Hampshire primary and probably will and probably inclined to support a candidate like her, uh, particularly with Chris Christie out of the race. Um, you know, if Haley can't win there and let's say Trump wins Iowa and New Hampshire, I don't know if there's much of a rationale for anyone else to even continue, given that, you know, I guess at that point, the only real threat to Trump would be um, some of these legal matters he's, he's dealing with. But he would have, you know, he, he would have basically stopped DeSantis in Iowa and stopped Haley in New Hampshire. But again, I, I could I could definitely see I, Haley winning New Hampshire, but that's not enough to make this thing a real horse race. I think Trump would have to lose South Carolina, too, uh, in order for we just to go into Super Tuesday and say, hey, this thing has really opened up. That's Kyle Kondik from Savado's Crystal Ball. And Tom, the 2024 race is really just about to get started. 
Thank you, Kaylee and Joe. And that was Bloomberg Sound on co-host Joe Matthew and Kaylee Lines reporting from our Bloomberg 991 newsroom in Washington. And you can hear Sound on weekdays, 1 to 3 p.m. on Bloomberg Radio. And coming up here on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we take a look at the geopolitical machinations surrounding the business of computer chip manufacturing. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.